Welcome to New York, everybody. Right now, we're on the Brooklyn side, taking a look at the Manhattan skyline behind me. This is a really cool spot for photography. It's called the Brooklyn Bridge Park Pylons. And you can see the reason being, there are a bunch of pylons here right behind me. And as you move to the left and right, there's this little sort of dock area and rocks, and you can set up anywhere along here frame the pylons in the foreground with the city skyline in the background. It's actually a really cool place because it gives you a lot of opportunities to shoot uh, interesting compositions during the sunset and the blue hour. And as you can see with the really bright light behind me, the sun is getting ready to set just to the left of the skyline itself. What's really fun about this lesson is it's the first time I'm going to be using the new Fujifilm GFX 50S medium format mirrorless camera. So this is a 50 megapixel camera and it shoots in a different aspect ratio than usual. Everything that I've been shooting before previously in these tutorials has been with the Fujifilm cameras or the Nikon cameras, which is APS-C and full frame sensors that shoot in an aspect of three to two, which is a little bit different than the medium format that shoots four to three. So if you think the way three to two works, you actually have a little bit more cropped on the bottom, but four to three actually gives you a little bit more on the top and the bottom. So the composition changes instead of being mostly wide or horizontal, it looks a little bit more like a square format. So it can be really interesting when you're setting up unique compositions. And it's definitely a challenge when you first start using it compared to APS-C and full frame at the two to three ratio. Since it's the first time we're gonna take a look at a four by three aspect, I've actually set up both cameras behind me I have the new GFX medium format camera here on the left, and I've set up the X-T2 with the 10 to 24 lens on it right here on the right, so we can take a look at the difference. The thing is, on the medium format camera, I have a 23 millimeter lens. That's a little bit funny because that 23 actually translates into the equivalency of 18 millimeter at full frame. Now remember, we're actually going down a little bit from 23 becomes 18 at medium format, where something like this 10 to 24 actually goes up and becomes a 16 to 35. So what I'm going to do is I have this, let's say that it's a fixed 18 millimeter equivalent right now. What I'm doing is I'm creating a composition that's very close to the same thing here by just adjusting it to look like it's about 18 millimeters. So the frames aren't going to be exactly the same because they're side by side and not exactly zoomed the same but they're gonna be really close. We can take a look at how that cropping changes with three to two and four to three. With these two cameras now side by side and set up, let's take a few quick shots and see the difference between four to three and three by two. First things first, let's start with the camera that we've been using this entire tutorial, Fujifilm X-T2. I'm gonna take a quick reference photo here. As you can see in this frame, composition's pretty nice. Have the pylons mostly stacked on the right, a nice gap on the left, and the pylons a little bit farther away on the left. I've centered the horizon, so I've maintained a very straight edge on all of the buildings. The verticals are perfect, and I'm getting a nice sky right now. We're very lucky with a really beautiful sky. But what you can see here is this is the normal aspect that we're used to working on. It's a little bit wide, but it's not ultra wide. It's nothing like 16 by nine when I've been shooting in video mode. All right, now same thing here. I'm gonna take a quick reference photo using the medium format GFX with a different aspect ratio. Let's take a look at this frame together. As you can see, it's pretty much the same composition, but what you'll notice is I have more sky and more pylons in the foreground. So if you think about it this way, you have four by three and three by two. It's the same width but it's the height that changes. And an interesting thing about this camera is this is the default aspect ratio. It gives me the greatest amount of pixels, but in the settings, I could set it to three by two. If I really didn't want to work in four by three, I could set this to three by two. And what it would do, it would leave the frame almost the same and it would just crop a little bit off the top and the bottom to simulate a three to two format that I'm more used to. But the thing is, then I wouldn't be able to take advantage of the full 50 megapixels. It would shave a few megapixels off the top and the bottom of the frame. So if this camera is capable of shooting 50 megapixels and that happens to be at a four by three aspect ratio, I'd rather shoot as much as I can and then maybe decide to crop later if I want to simulate something that's a little bit wider. Now that we've compared these individually, it's really difficult for me to say which one I prefer or which one is actually better. Each has something unique. 
I usually use 3x2, and throughout this tutorial, we've done very few vertical shots. So you guys know that I really like to shoot things in a wide format because I feel it's really cinematic. But on the other hand, I kind of like with this shot that I get more of the pylons on the bottom and more of the sky. 4 to 3 is kind of an art form in itself, and for me it's kind of exciting because it challenges me in a different way. It challenges me to think about composition in a different way. And since I'm always kind of stuck on that wide cinematic look that I really like. This has been a fun exercise and it's going to continue to be a fun exercise to challenge my brain in new ways. So since this is a water shot and the water is moving around these pylons, what I want to do before the blue hour starts, while there's nice light in the sky, I want to blur this water and I'm going to do that by using a neutral density filter. So I have a 10 stop neutral density filter right here and I'm going to put it on the front of the camera very carefully because it's very cold. and everything when it's cold is much more difficult to do. So this is F11, 30 second exposure. I have a 10 stop filter here and I'm using my remote release here just to make sure I don't touch the camera while it vibrates. It's a little bit windy. I'm using my extremely stable tripod for this. It's also a bigger camera. So I've switched from the smaller tripod back to the big one to make sure that everything is nice and stable. Higher megapixel means you want to use a more stable tripod just to be certain. It's also very windy, and did I mention freezing out here? These birds are also gonna leave streaks in the frame, but that's easy to take care of in Photoshop. So I'll go ahead and start this exposure. 30 second exposure is done. Water looks really good. What I'm gonna do now is get a bracketed exposure for the sky. So I'm gonna remove this. It's a very easy filter holder to remove. I'm gonna put it down here so it's safe. Keeping the camera settings exactly the same, I'm gonna switch back to bracketing because it's a very bright sky. Make some few adjustments here, just a small adjustment, and I'm gonna shoot my exposure brackets. Bracketed exposures look really good. Sky's still looking really good. What I'm gonna do is switch back to the neutral density filter. I'm gonna to try to get a series of different exposure times so I can soften out the water. Just before the sunset reached the peak of the beautiful colors, I was shooting long exposures at 30 seconds so I could smooth out the water and still get the reflection of the brightness of the sun itself. So I ended up with a little bit of reflection of red in the water. As soon as I was happy with those shots, I was able to take the neutral density filter off and since I was still shooting into a very bright background, the sky and the sun itself, I decided to set this to shoot exposure brackets and I captured what I was going to need for the sky itself. Luckily the sky started turning into really beautiful colors. I was able to get some of the red fringing on the clouds and that dissipated pretty quickly. So what I did is I shot through the entire sequence of the sky until now. Right now we're kind of in that mid transition where the sun's gone down a little bit, the sky's still a little bit too bright, but the city lights are just starting to come on. So in another 15 minutes, I think blue hour is going to be perfect. So right now with the camera, Everything is exactly the same as before. I've actually chose to keep it at f11 just because there are some pylons that are pretty close to the camera and I'm shooting infinite. The focus is still sent to infinite. Everything is the same, but what I'm gonna do is prepare to capture the blue hour itself. So as it starts to get darker, now my shutter speeds are naturally gonna start to drag or extend. So I won't need that neutral density filter anymore if I want to get smooth water. The reason I had to use it before is because the sky was so bright, the only shutter speeds I could achieve in camera were way too fast to smooth out the water. Everything was nice and crisp. But now as I enter the blue hour, the lights in the city are going to turn on and the water is going to naturally be smooth because my shutter speeds are going to be longer by default. It's about 20 minutes later now. It's starting to enter a beautiful time of blue hour. The city lights look fantastic. 
The sky behind the city is still a little bright. I may have to wait a few more minutes before I get the perfect shot, but everything's starting to look great. I think I'm going to be able to get a really nice blue hour shot to blend with the sunset. But what's really interesting here is shooting all of these different versions. I have a long exposure version where I have the soft water. I have a still version, a version without the neutral density where I was able to freeze the sky and freeze the water in motion. And now I'm shooting a blue hour shot. So this is going to be a fairly beautiful yet complex blend inside of Photoshop. So it's really going to be interesting not only to get all of these different frames in, take a look at them and see which ones I want to join together, but it's also going to be really interesting to use these Fujifilm files. What I've been researching about this camera in particular is the ability to really pull more out of the shadows and highlights. So we have a great deal more of dynamic range to play with. So that's going to be really fun to figure out how to blend this all together and take advantage of these bigger files and higher dynamic range. So it is absolutely freezing out here. I'm going to hurry up, take the last shots that I need. We're going to pack it up, go somewhere super warm, and the next time I see you guys, it'll be in post-processing. Welcome to the post-processing studio, everybody. And my favorite thing about being here right now is that we're not in New York City in the winter time. Interesting fact is we've been to Iceland in the winter. We've been to some pretty cold places filming, photographing the world, but New York City wins. It was by far the coldest place we visited and we did not expect that or dress appropriately. That being said, it was a really fun place to shoot and the Brooklyn Bridge pylons continue to be one of my favorite photography destinations on the planet. That was a really exciting lesson. It gave me the opportunity to work with some long exposure frames and shoot with the Fujifilm GFX 50S, which is a medium format camera. So we were able to examine the difference between three to two and four to three aspect ratios. And I've went ahead and pulled a couple frames and we're gonna do a multi-stage blend together. So let's go ahead and take a look at Lightroom and get started. Right here inside of Lightroom, I've actually brought three frames for us to work on for this lesson. Now, this is gonna be our base exposure, and for one, you can see, yes, it's very underexposed, but the clouds look really nice. In fact, right now, you can see it is a 30-second exposure. If I would've ramped that up to a 60-second exposure, I would've blown out the sky way too much. So we're dealing with a scene that has a really hot sky. All I really wanted to do was soften the water, and as you can see, the water is nice and soft. I also want to bring in some other details, mainly the highlights on these pylons themselves. So you can see this is another long exposure shot a little bit earlier directly into the sun. You can see we have some lens flares going on, which isn't going to be a problem. But essentially what we're going to want to do is use the highlights for these pylons with this shot. But of course that's not going to be enough for photographing the world or this shot. We're also going to come in and then use the lights from the city during blue hour. So this is gonna be a really interesting blend and a lot of fun. So let's go ahead and get started with the base exposure. First of all, I wanna address one thing that's a little bit different here. This is the first time we've worked with the Fujifilm GFX. So my settings for the GFX 50S are zero sharpening and zero noise reduction. The clarity of this sensor is unbelievable. The other thing was, is I was shooting with a solid neutral density filter, and that filter was 100 millimeters. Now, this is a fairly large lens, the 23 millimeter, which is the 18 millimeter equivalent in 35 millimeters. So I ended up with a little bit of vignetting. Now, remember, in the profile settings, everything's built in with Fujifilm. You can even see that it says built in lens profile applied. But since I am shooting long exposure, if I was using a screw on neutral density filter, then I would get an even more deep vignetting, but here it's not so bad. So I can just go ahead and adjust this accordingly until it kind of goes away. And it looks like somewhere between 30 and 50 solves the problem. So this isn't going to appear uniformly on every long exposure you shoot, but sometimes it's always good to double check. Now, though I'm not going to use any of these, I just want to point out, just like any other Fujifilm camera, we can change this from Adobe Standard to Provia Velvia Astia classic chrome or anything like that. And you can see it does pop out the colors, but I wanna work on the colors manually. So we're just gonna go with the standard mode and do the colors together in Photoshop. So now let's go ahead and make the adjustments to the scene. First thing, 
it's way underexposed in the foreground. Now, with Fujifilm cameras in general, you can always recover a lot in the shadows. The GFX 50S really does a good job with this, and you can even recover three to four stops in the shadows. So you can see as I start to slide this up to three stops, even to four stops, we're still seeing the detail in those pylons, which is incredible. But we don't need to go that far. Let's just go about one stop or one and a quarter. That looks pretty good. Let's also pull the shadows up a little bit until we start to see those details. And you know what? I have a feeling that the blacks are gonna be a problem. So let's go ahead and bring the blacks up a little bit too. And let's round out these settings. So we have one and a quarter stop, 30 and 20. Obviously by bringing the exposure up, we're gonna have to take care of the sky. Let's do that with a gradient. And let's start it fairly tight here, right from the horizon to the top of the city, something like that. Let's go ahead and take this back to zero and let's pull the highlights way down until we get them back. Maybe half a stop, so negative 50. Should probably do the trick. While we're at it, let's add some deep contrast with a little bit of dehaze. Somewhere around 15 or 20 should do, so we'll just pick 20. And you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and increase some of the warmth here. Let's just add a little bit of warmth back to the sky just to pop these details and get some of the pinks back. I think that looks pretty good. Another thing I might want to do is grab a circle gradient here and really adjust that hot spot individually. So we'll go ahead and invert the mask. Let's leave that shadows at 25, but let's pull the highlights down about the same. Well, the reason I'm doing the shadows is sometimes if you pull the highlights down, it darkens the pixels around it. So I want it to still look a little dreamy, a little soft, but I definitely want to tweak it so we get more of that sky. And as I close this down, let's go back to that gradient. Let me just go ahead and make an adjustment. I want that to affect more of the sky. So you can see as I pull this down, we're actually affecting a little bit more of the sky itself, just like that. Now I'll go back and double check this one and just make sure that I'm getting everything that I need inside of this selection with the highlights. I might even want to go down just a little bit more, about negative 30, just to balance it out completely. That looks pretty good. All right, so this is gonna serve as the base exposure. Now, we could argue that this is a little dark right now. We probably wanna bring that out. But a couple things are gonna happen. One, we're gonna bring in the city lights. So we're gonna assume we're gonna need some dark pixels behind it so that those lights pop. The other thing is, is I'm gonna be bringing in the highlights of this layer. So I wanna make sure that we match these. And you can see as I toggle back and forth, let me command click this and we'll just arrow left and right. What I want to do is match them in basic exposure. So I want them to be pretty close to each other. And right now they are close, but I think I'm going to need to adjust this one just a little bit. So let's pull the exposure down just a tiny little bit. That looks pretty good. Let's also pull the highlights down quite a bit. That looks pretty good right there. We'll also pull the whites down just a little bit. Something right around there. And you know what? We'll adjust the blacks just to pull that up a little bit. Let's toggle back and forth. I'll let that redraw really quick and you can see they're pretty close. Now obviously this one has sharp lighting coming in from the left to the right, this one does not. But underneath that, they look fairly similar. So with both of them selected, let's go ahead and export those. My settings shouldn't have changed, so I can export with previous, It'll be a 16-bit PSD. This is gonna be our base exposure. So I'll go over here, select all, copy, close, and paste. Now, just for fun, we'll go up to image size. This is basically 8,000 by 6,000, and inches you can see it's 27 by 20. So this is a 50 megapixel camera, so it's already very high resolution. You can see with the 24 megapixel camera, we were doing panoramic images in Dubai to stitch a larger result, but with the GFX, you already get the 50 megapixels. So you can imagine putting this on a pano rig, shooting a series of frames, and you could get some crazy resolutions. But anyway, this background image, just to sort of review from an earlier lesson, this background image will actually have all of the metadata. So if somebody reads the metadata from this file, Everything that you do in this PSD will come from this one. So when I added this one on top, this background layer becomes the metadata associated with this PSD. With that being said, let's go ahead and mask this in. First thing I wanna do is try our favorite trick, which is changing this to lighten. Now if I do that, a couple of good things happen. I get the pylons, I get some of the light. 
Um, but it looks a little funny around here, especially on the bottom of these pylons. And you can see that color change because between this shot, the tide actually changed. And you're seeing those lines down here. So that's not going to work. I don't want to have to mask out these highlights. So what we're actually going to do is just blend this naturally on top with the normal blending mode. And we're going to do that with some simple masking. So the first thing is I'll add a mask and I'll decide first using the gradient tool that we obviously don't want any of the sky in this. We just want these pylons here. So I'll draw a gradient from about here to here. And you can see now we end up with this. So we get the whole bottom of the image. Now I don't want the entire image. I only want these pylons here. So I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to select multiply now. And with the mask selected, we're going to go white to black. And I'll hold shift to lock that down. Now what we can do is go in and paint in some of the difference. So I'll go ahead and grab the brush, make sure this is selected. And with a 10% flow, I'll go ahead and paint in some of these highlights, just like this. So we'll paint that in. It just has to be close. Now I have to be careful because I don't want to go over here because that's the area that we don't want. But I definitely want to blend this into itself. And I definitely want some of that edge of each one of these to sort of come up. If we toggle it on and off, we can see that that's blending in nicely. I might want to remove just a little bit right here and right here. And then we'll just go ahead and clean that up just a little bit. The other thing is if I turn this on and off, and if I shift click the mask, you can see that we light up the trees a little bit in the park itself. So I have to decide if I zoom in here, I can actually brush in a little bit of this. So with 10%, we can just go ahead and bring in some of these trees and some of that natural lighting back into there. Bring that back. And we'll just double check this again. That actually looks pretty good. You can see we get some seagulls over there too. Not bad. And just one last check right here. Actually blends in fairly well. All right. So that looks pretty good. We're going to leave this here for now. I'm going to save it in the background. Let's go back to Lightroom. And let's talk about the blue hour shot. All right. Shot number three here. What I'm going to do is what I typically do, we call it 50-50. So we're just going to go ahead and put the highlights down, negative 50, and we're going to put the shadows up, positive 50. The only thing I'm really concerned about, there is not going to be any overlap down here. Everything that I'm concerned about is right inside of the city itself, just the lights. Let's take this, export with previous. Select all, copy, close and paste on top. So we'll call this adjusted LE. Or you know what? I'll write it out. Adjusted long exposure. And we'll call this adjusted lit long exposure. And we'll call this blue hour. All right, so we have this base frame starting to look pretty nice. It's coming together. Next thing we have to do is bring in the blue hour. And for that, we're going to go up here and we're going to see what Lighten does. First of all, city looks really cool. Sky looks horrible, but I have a feeling something else happened too. Let's go ahead and zoom in. These lights, they feel... Oh, wow. Yeah, you can see that's way off. Let's go ahead and turn it back to normal. If I actually toggle this on and off, yeah, you can see a huge shift in pixels. Check this out from here to here. So a huge shift. So when I actually change this to lighten, you can see actually what happens. We're sort of missing some edges. So that's a big problem. Now, obviously, this shifted a little bit during shooting. That could have been the wind. That could have been me. It could have been Patrick. Let's, let's just blame Patrick. Let's just say Patrick did this. Let's say Patrick accidentally bumped the camera somehow. And since he did that, we have to kind of adjust it. So we can do that in normal mode, lighten mode, or we can use something extreme like difference. Let's change it to difference. And with difference selected, if I zoomed in, we can see these edges here. It's really clear, uh, the edges. So let's just go ahead and nudge the blue hour just with the arrow keys. I'll make sure that the select and move tool is active, and I'll just move this up a couple pixels, and that actually looks pretty good. Now, it's not going to be perfect. You can see here that it actually rotated a little bit, so I could move it to the left, but that's going to offset it here to the right. 
So what I want to do is kind of average it. I'm more concerned with the heart of the city here. These edges, I think we can mess with a little bit in post. So I want to make sure, no, nope, can't move it up anymore. Don't want to move it down. So we got to keep it right in the middle, right about there. All right. And we'll also see that we're starting to lose edges here and in the trees. But for the most part, just moving it a little bit like that. If we change this back to lighten, let's take a look. Actually, all right, that's much better already. Let's zoom in and sort of take a look at that result. Now, obviously, these towers here, the Freedom Tower, we're going to want to make sure. Now, obviously, these towers here, the Freedom Tower, we're obviously going to want to make sure that that aligns as closely as possible. Now, the nice thing about using this blending mode, this lighten blending mode, is if it's off a half a pixel, it's just putting the light over top of the building. So it can be just a little bit off. And you can see here, for example, watch this part. If I turn that off and on, you can see the lights sit right over top of the pixels underneath. So I think that's going to work. So let's go ahead and zoom out a little bit. Let's go ahead and start masking this out. So obviously, we can create a mask. But even more obvious, we don't want any of the bottom of the frame. So let's go ahead and zap that out first. Zoom in with the gradient tool, and I'm just going to go ahead and say that we want it from about here to here. I'm going to hold shift. We're going to get rid of everything underneath the dock line there. So that's perfect. That's a good start. Next thing is, let's go ahead and paint out some of the areas that we don't need. So let me go ahead and grab the brush tool, and I'll go ahead and set the flow to 100% because I just want to go ahead and get rid of all this. Let's go ahead and paint this out. Really easy. Just go ahead and get rid of a lot of this. Kind of tighten it up right on the city. All right, next thing, let's go ahead and work on this area. If I turn this layer on and off, you can see that these lights look pretty good here. This looks bad, and I'm not getting a lot of effect here on the haze of the sky. But I don't want to light up this area. I'm actually going to get rid of some of this. So let's go ahead and paint some of this out here much smaller brush and a harder edge. So I'll change the edge of that as well. And we'll just get rid of some of this. We'll clean all this up. So I'm just going to hand paint out this area just like that. And the nice thing is, is these lights don't have to be there. For example, if you don't want that light to be there, you can just take it out. Or if you have an area where you have pixels that are surrounding it, like this area, if I zoom in here, we can see a very light purple. Any of this here, you can see that I can just go ahead and brush it out right on the side of the building. So what we're going to do is just go ahead and paint these little areas out, just like this, all around these edges. All around these edges, just like that. And you know what? If we happen to paint out a couple of the lights, it's not that big of a deal because they weren't there before and they're just sitting over top. So some of these areas here we can just go ahead and get rid of if they're distracting or if that sky is taking its place. Now, for something like this, we could try to paint, but you can see that we're actually painting out some of the building and it's changing the color. So what I actually want to do here is mask, manually mask some of this. The first thing I'm actually going to do is sort of draw a loose mask around this, something like this, just a garbage mask, just to get rid of all the areas that I know are going to disappear, like this. So I don't want to miss any of these areas. So we're just going to go ahead and select all of this and I'm going to fill that all with black. Now, we'll zoom in quite far in, change the lasso tool, and what I'm going to do is manually draw on the inside of the building here, just this edge, and we're just going to go ahead and select these linear lines just like this. I'm going to stay inside the building's edge, so at least one pixel inside like this, and anywhere that there's sky, I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of as well, just like this. And we can actually just go ahead and get rid of that whole top section. That top section doesn't have any light on it. Here, and here. So after I finish this, I'll go ahead and zoom out, Command minus, and I'll go ahead and just wrap this mask back around and fill it with black. 
Command-D for deselect. If I zoom in here, you can see this edge. Now we have this dark edge here, right here. So what I'm actually going to do is first here, select the mask, select the properties, and we're just going to feather it half a pixel. So just half a pixel, soften that up a little bit. Now I'm going to back out a little bit, and since this is sort of off a little bit, in other words, that shifted, what I'm actually going to do is soften the paintbrush here, leave it black, I'll take the flow down to something like 10, and I'm actually just going to soften that up a little bit, just so those lights, the lighting of the building sort of softly blend in with each other. Same thing around here, you can see that we're removing some of that light, but we're actually softening that hard edge transition. Now, remember, when I shifted this around, we actually had to shift this in the difference mode, I really paid attention to the inside of the city because I knew that the shift wasn't, a linear shift had a little rotation too, so I wanted to make sure that the core of the city was the most important. So we're going to have to do a little bit of adjustment here on these boundaries, but hopefully as we get towards the right, it'll be a little bit better. That looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and continue the selection process. Close this. Pull up the lasso again. Zoom in to wherever you feel comfortable. We'll go ahead and pick this mask up here. Hold Option and keep going. So again, same thing here. You don't really have to worry about those little edges. And we can just go ahead and keep it just on the inside here. You can see this layer. There was a lot of light before. So let's go ahead and leave this. You know what? Let's go ahead and take that off too. We'll take that one out. And we'll go all the way up the edge here. Zoom out just a little bit. Continue it off the top. Close that off. And I'll zoom in one more level here. And I'll continue the mask by holding Shift all the way up here. And the same thing. We'll just go ahead and draw mostly around these shapes. And anything that's outside, like obviously I'm not going to spend time selecting that lattice work. Definitely not worth it. This little light on the corner of the building, definitely not worth it. We'll just go ahead and clean that up with another pass. And I'm going to go ahead and fill this. We'll back it out a little bit because I want to see what it's going to do to this area too. We'll go ahead and fill this with black. That uh, looks pretty good. That was the right decision there. You can see, if I actually undo that, you can see that the highlight from the sky is actually correct now because I removed it. So that was the right choice there. Good. That means we don't have to redo it. Same thing here, though. I'm not happy with this edge. We're going to go back to the brush here. And using a small brush and a low flow, we're just going to go ahead and paint some of that out. So all I'm doing is transitioning those. So transitioning these, some of this, and this edge, too. We can just go ahead and make it a little softer, the transition. Pretty easy. Here, too, let's go ahead and soften that transition. Soften it here. And all I'm doing is sort of custom fading them into each other, which is pretty simple. On this side, actually, we haven't masked yet, but I think it's going to be a little bit better once we get to here. So let's go ahead and continue this mask. Zoom in. Actually, let's zoom out first. Let's go ahead and lasso out these areas that we know we're getting rid of, which is all this. And let's zoom in again and continue this. So we continue it about here. We'll just go ahead and click across. Nice stair-stepping on this building. If we were in Italy, nothing would be straight, but we're in New York City. So we have all this great architecture to work with. Same thing here. Let's go ahead and zoom right in. Add to this mask. Well, that's a nice thing about the polygonal lasso tool. I don't think we have to worry too much about the top of that building. There is no light on it. It's pretty easy. Let's go ahead and fill this. That looks pretty good. Same thing here. Back to the brush. Let's just go ahead and brush some of the difference in. Soften that out so we don't end up with an edge. Just because those pixels did move a little tiny bit, that's looking pretty good. Let's move over here, and you can see we have to do the same thing. Now, at this point, we can continue with the lasso tool, or we can try to use the brush. This is just much easier for me to go ahead and select the building using the lasso tool. We'll just go ahead and finish it up this way. This stage in the tutorial, and especially with this high megapixel image, 
becomes much more crucial to get all of this right. Let's go ahead and do that, just like that. And remember, there's not a lot of light on these buildings, so there's not going to be a lot of overlap. For something like this, definitely get rid of anything that's semi-transparent. So we'll call that semi-transparent. We'll zoom this out a little bit. Close that out. Fill it with black. We'll zoom in, take a look at the difference. Brush into fade. And actually, that looks pretty good. Okay, let's move on. It looks pretty good. Let's zoom out a little bit and let's see what we're actually getting. So a lot of this here is actually not showing through. So you can see we don't really have to worry about anything on this area. And even if I zoom in here, you can see that we're not transferring any of those pixels to that part of that sky. Here, on the other hand, we are. And personally, I don't like that, actually. I do not like that light. So I'm going to get rid of it. So we have a little bit of creative freedom here to get rid of some of the lights. That light is way too intense. But definitely here on the tower, I want to be really careful with the lasso tool. We'll start it right here, just in case. There's some surrounding pixels. Here, we'll chisel out the edge of this light that we determine. And we'll go ahead and fill this. That looks pretty nice. All right, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. This all looks pretty good. Everything here looks fine. Freedom Tower looks pretty good. You can see we have some problems in the sky here. Let's go ahead and zap all of this out. So we'll get rid of all of this. Perfect. And we'll zoom in and we'll start working on the tops of these buildings here. Freedom Tower, double check. Pretty good. And let's just go ahead and start on the edge of the Freedom Tower here and work on the top of this building. I'm going to cut out any of those little things that don't really matter, any of these edges here. Same thing, top of that's gone. We'll actually get this one, this one, and you know what? I don't, I don't like those lights. We're going to go ahead and get rid of those lights as well. Close this off. Pan over a little bit. Same thing. Add to the selection. And we're just going to keep on going. Now, a lot of this here, there's going to be a couple issues, uh, and we'll get to them as soon as we get over there. I don't really like the top of this building, so I'm going to cut around it. And I'm going to determine, since we have this great overlap now, which areas are going to be lit and which areas are not. And let's just go ahead and terminate this one right here. Let's fill that with black. And I think we're going to have to do a little bit of br whoops, a little bit of brushing. And change the flow to 10 here. Brush a little bit of that in. Fade that into itself a little bit. That looks pretty good. All right, so this area here, this is a huge problem area. Because one, well, we're trying to overlay things here. It moved, and it was windy, so the trees move. Everything kind of moves. So what I'm actually going to do is just switch to the brush, and we're going to take a lot of this out. So let's just go ahead and get rid of this manually. Let's pick 100% flow. Let's sharpen the edges of the brush a little bit, and let's just go ahead and paint it out. We'll leave that light but this whole post is gone. I'll tell you what, the whole side of that building, gone. This light, easier if it's gone. Same thing here, let's just go ahead and bring some of this, get rid of this, the edge of this building, you can see that it's gonna come back. Now, changing the opacity, we're just gonna go ahead and fade out some of the sky, get rid of that building, keep some of this, and fade that out. We'll just toggle this on and off real quick, just to check. Make sure we didn't miss anything there on the left. That looks pretty good. And what we're going to do here is actually paint out. We'll soften this. And we'll just go ahead and paint all this out. All of this is going to go. Even this building here, the tops of these, all of the trees. That's all got to go. Zoom in a little bit. Let's focus right on the edge of this. Same thing with this building. I could switch to the lasso tool, but I feel pretty good about doing this manually. I think this is a pretty easy thing to paint. Let's go ahead and clean that up. And zoom out a little bit. Zoom out a little bit. Zoom out a little more. Turn this on and off. Let's take a look at the mask overlay here. 
and you can see we, it's not that we missed spots, but these spots actually don't bother the image. There's nothing that overlays. So we don't actually have to do this, but this is a good indication of, of little areas that we might have missed. And it's probably good to just double check to make sure that those don't add up or do anything. But what I'm really concerned about is this area here. And you can see that we've gotten rid of pretty much everything. Things around here, it's always good to go back and double check and make sure that that's not adding anything to it. And it looks like it's okay here. You know what, little tiny details. It's 50 megapixels, so we should be careful. Zoom that out a little bit more. Pan over and take a look. One more try. That looks pretty good. So now let's take a look at all these together. So we have this one underneath. That blends in pretty well into this highlight. That highlight blends in fairly well. This sits over top. I guess I have to decide if we like this light here. And do we like that light? I'm not really convinced. So let's go ahead and brush some of that out. Soften this back up, change the flow to 10, and we'll just go ahead and brush out some of that light on those trees. I don't really want to bring any attention to those dead trees. Let's back it out again and take a look. Much better. Our blend's looking good. Time to move on to the next step. My favorite, object removal. So let's go ahead and create a new layer. And we'll name it OBJ Removal. And let's kind of look around here. Well, everything here was okay. We're not going to remove the trees. And the other thing I have going on with this, this is a brand new camera. I basically took it out of the box and started using it, so it doesn't have any dust spots on it. I know that the sensor is very clean, which is very unlike me, I know. But let's just talk about this. This is the Statue of Liberty, and I'm sorry, Statue of Liberty, but I find you very distracting at the moment, just because it's cropped. I kind of like this, but I, I just want to clean that up really quick. And in order to do that, it's pretty easy, but I'm just going to go ahead and create a selection uh, just so that I don't accidentally mask something I don't want to. And I'm going to do that just by clicking around here, just like this. And I'll go up to Select, Modify Feather, Feather by one pixel. And now when I use the clone stamp, on Lady Liberty, I'm so sorry. My apologies. We'll be able to get rid of all that here. And stay inside the box, so to speak. Might want to grab some of the lighter color. Pull some of the lighter color in. We're happy with that. Command D for deselect. Very easy way. Other things here we have to look at. Million seagulls. So this is really going to be a fun exercise. The next step we are going to remove a thousand seagulls from this frame. I'm just kidding. We're going to remove like 10 tops. And in order to do that, I'm going to do the same thing. I don't feel as bad removing the seagulls as I did the Statue of Liberty, but you know what? We're going to do the same thing with selections. Uh, just because I want to maintain the edges of the pylons, it's too hard to uh, sort of mask around them. So basically just grab a wide area like this. And what you'll see me do is go up to Select, Modify Feather. And that way, when I go to the Clone Stamp and I paint, you can see that I won't disrupt that edge. We'll keep that edge intact. So we'll deselect that. Now, there are a lot of blurry seagulls. So birds and long exposure, not so great. I don't know that, what that is, actually, but we're going to take care of it in a minute. So we just have to go in and decide. Now, keep in mind, too, that sometimes people think that when you work with higher megapixel cameras, it makes things easier. It actually makes things more difficult because you can see way more of the details. Yes, that's a good thing, but it causes you to have to really go in and fix a lot more. Because if you're going to print this wall size, 50 megapixel, 100 megapixel, you're going to want to make sure that everything is as perfect as possible. If somebody walks right up to this in a gallery, for example, and sees a bunch of things that shouldn't be there, that's probably going to be bad. Will somebody notice blurry seagulls? Is this seagull really important to remove? You know, I really don't know. But if we were going to try to do this, I think the best way is to just figure out what object should be solid. And let's just say that that seagull is sharp enough. And we're just going to kind of feather this around here. Same thing with this little 
seagull halo going on right there. And what I'm doing is just creating sort of large selections of things, just like this. So we'll go and find the edges of the seagulls, just like that. So same thing, I'll just go ahead and fix my little selection and feather this. The reason I'm feathering it is just to have a softer edge and then going back to the clone stamp and grabbing similar colors, similar colors being here. And uh, for this ghost, ghost bird, the ghost birds like that. And you can see that's a little bit better. Uh, same thing, this guy here. We'll just go ahead and get rid of that one. You know what? Let's get rid of the whole area just like this. And a feather one more time. Soften that out. That should be good enough for the seagulls. Obviously, we can go in and seek and destroy here with these birds. This one, I'm going to leave it intact for now. As an exercise, if you guys want to go ahead and clean up more of them, you can definitely be my guest. Here, something like this, let's immediately go to the heel brush and see what happens. And that's pretty good. In fact, it's close. All I have to do is just back it up again with the brush, maybe like a 10% flow, and just sort of brush some of that softly back in. Little spots like this, same thing. Anything that's distracting, sometimes with a long exposure, you'll get clumping in the water. And if you end up with clumping, sometimes it's good to get rid of it. It can look like a mistake. Usually it's okay. And then something like this, I'm just gonna go ahead and clean that highlight up a little bit. I think it's a little too intense. So we'll just soften that up. And we'll take a look. Let's look around here. Again, there's no dirt on this sensor, which is great. Uh, there might be some little things down here in the water. But for the most part, I think that's gonna be okay. And back here too, this might be something worth cleaning up, um, the sort of darker spots, and we can probably do that easily just by using sort of a soft brush like this. So kind of getting rid of some of this, these darker spots. And those could be seagulls flying, just currents in the water, and sometimes when current sits, uh, it causes some darker spots. But that overall looks pretty good. Now that we have our base blend, select everything, group it together with Command-G, and we'll call this Blended Result. And as usual, what I want to do is Shift-Option-Command-E, create a new layer. We're going to call this ACRF. And we're just going to do a basic color correction just to marry it all together using the Camera Raw filter. Here in the Camera Raw filter, I actually want to select everything individually, so we're going to start with the sky. I want to do a separate selection for the sky and for the water, because we have a lot of highlights here and a lot of shadows here. So I'm going to start with the sky selection, and I'm going to hold Shift to make sure that it binds. And we're going to keep this fairly tight, so it starts at the bottom of the city to the top. And what we actually want to do, let's go ahead and reset those corrections. I'm going to tint it a little to the magenta side, and I'm also going to pull the temperature down just to cool it, give it a kind of a purple and nice pink color in the sky. And I pulled the temperature down to offset that tint into magenta just so that we get these blues back. While we're at it, let's put a little bit of dehaze in there, just a little bit, and let's pull the shadows up just a little bit. I don't want the tops of the buildings looking like they got dehazed. Let's create a second one just for the bottom. And we'll stop that one here. We'll make this one even tighter of a fall off for the gradient. Pull this up just a little bit, right at the horizon, and reset this one. Let's go ahead and tweak the exposure a little bit, maybe a quarter stop. And let's do the same thing in the shadows. Let's see how that looks. Yep, and that's exactly what I want. See how we're pulling out the little details in the top of these pylons? That's looking pretty good but I think we'll add a little bit of contrast just to pull it back together. Maybe 15% and we'll tighten that up. Whoops, tighten it up by holding shift. It'd be better to lock it down. Just like that. Some minor adjustment, we'll go ahead and apply it because I want to do the rest manually. 
Throughout the entire duration of Photographing the World 3, I've really focused on breaking us out of the need to use third-party plugins. But the other thing I wanted to do was use luminosity masking in a way that shows you that you also don't need any panels or luminosity blending plugins as well. Now, so far in this tutorial series, we've created every single one of our masks manually. But now that we've done that, I want to show you how to automate it a little bit. And we're going to do that by creating our own custom actions. But we're going to have to create them manually and then bind them to certain action sets. It's actually much easier than I'm making it sound. And if you want to access the actions, you can go here under Window and Actions. I actually have it here. It's the little play button. So these are all of my actions. Some of them are default. Some of them I made. We're actually going to create two together. So actions are pretty cool. You can use them to basically record any procedure inside of Photoshop, anything that you can do. I do it for resizing, I do it for watermarking, I do it for saving, and I also do it for luminosity masking. So let's say here in the channels we want to create a highlights channel, a shadows channel, and a midtones channel. Well, we know that's pretty easy, but let's say we do that every single time. And in Photographing the World 3, we've kind of done that every single time. So why don't we just create an action? Well, the reason we didn't create an action is I wanted to teach you guys how to create those manually each and every time. Now that we've done that a few times, let's go ahead and bind it to an action. So the first thing is you have to create a new action. You can put that in a new folder, create a new folder of actions, or move them around and arrange them later. Go ahead and create one now. New action. We're going to call this Create luminosity masks and we'll say shadows highlights midtones now that is a pretty long name when i hit record it's going to start recording so now everything i do inside of photoshop is going to be recorded so the first thing i'm going to do is command click the RGB and it's going to load that as a selection and you can see that it's set it to set selection so that's been recorded. Now instead of doing anything over here I'm actually going to go up to select save selection and it's going to save it. This is the name of my PSD. This will be the name of any PSD you have open and it's going to be a new channel. We're going to call this highlights. We'll call this highlights one and we'll create that channel. It's going to record it so now what we're going to do is command shift I inverse select save selection shadows one and say OK. Now we're going to select everything command A select all you can see that it set a new selection we're going to subtract highlights and shadows click on the OK Go once again, select, save selection, and we'll call this midtones. And we'll say OK. Now, that's all I wanted to do. Highlights, shadows, midtones. So we're going to go ahead and stop recording. So we have this new create luminosity mask, shadows, highlights, and I named it so long that it ran off the page. So let's test it. Let's go ahead and delete these. Let's get rid of these here. Whoops. Delete selected channels, yes. And let's go ahead and select this and just press play. Nice. So now you can see each time you open up a new scene, and you know you're going to be doing adjustments with the highlights, shadows, and midtones, you can use the custom action that you've created. Well, let's take it one step further. With these three luminosity masks, let's say that we want to create folders for color correction one for shadows, one for highlights, one for midtones. Well, we can do that in an action as well. So let's create a new one. So we're going to go ahead and create a new one. And we'll just call it so it doesn't run off the page. Apply Luminosity Masks. We'll say folders, like that. And I'll record. First thing, we'll go ahead and load highlights, go to the layers, create a folder, create a mask, name it highlights. Highlights 1, go back to the channels. And click shadows. We'll do that again for the shadows. One more time, go to the channels, load the midtones, 
create another folder. Midtones. Done. And we're going to go ahead and stop that. Now again, I'll go ahead and delete these. Just to test everything, you want to make sure that you test it. And we'll go back to the channels. We'll go ahead and delete these again. We'll run through the whole thing and make sure it works. Once these are here, they're saved. So all right, create luminosity masks. Done. Let's go to the layers. Apply them to folders. And it works. Now, really quickly in Photoshop, instead of spending money on custom luminosity masking plugins or custom panels, you can create your own custom action set that you can apply to any one of your scenes. So that's really, really powerful. And now that these are created, let's go ahead and make some adjustments. Let's start with the highlights. And specifically, I love this guy. I think it looks amazing. And this guy is super hot, but the reflection needs a little bit of work. So with everything selected here, we can take a look our highlights, our shadows, and our midtones even, all with the action. Let's go ahead and create a few things here. Let's start with a simple one. Let's start with a photo filter. Inside of the highlights, let's turn it to the 81 because that's a little bit more intense. And let's bring that up to like 60%. If I turn that on and off, you can see how that's adding a bunch of color right here on this side. That looks pretty good. And with the highlights enabled, you can see it's not really adding too much to these colors in the blues because the highlights are isolated. Let's turn it up just a little bit more. Something around 65. Close enough. 64. Well, let's say I just want it in this area. I don't want to adjust these highlights. I don't want to adjust the highlights in the sky. Using the gradient tool, really easy. We'll swap it so it's white to black and we'll start this color adjustment from here to here. So now it's just going to be on the left side of the image and we'll go ahead and stop it from here to here. So now it's just going to be on that little bottom left side and it's going to be altering the color. Well, let's go a little bit further. Let's adjust this area. Let's add a little bit more color to this part of the sky. I really like this. I want to leave that alone, but I want to adjust this part of the sky. Go down here. Let's create curves. So let's go ahead and set this to taste. First thing, I'm going to bump the red there a little bit. You can see that's changing the sky color. We'll just go subtle with that. We'll clean it up a little bit with the blue, give it a little bit more of a purple look. And I'll toggle this on and off. I really like the way that looks. I don't like that over here, uh, so we're going to go ahead and lock this off as well. We're going to say it's going to be from here. Well, actually, you know what? Let's say from here to here. So just that side of the image and from here to here. So you can see we've just locked that to that corner of the sky. On that same note, sky's looking amazing. We have all the colors, all of the lights, but let's go ahead and adjust the bottom of the image too. So let's bring up one more curves. And this time I'm just going to pay attention to the bottom here. Let's go ahead and clamp it. And we'll just go ahead and clamp it here on the right, just like that. So you can see that that's bringing the overall brightness of those highlights and the contrast up just a little bit. And we'll just go ahead and lock that off from here to about here. And we'll take a look. That looks pretty good. So we're just basically adjusting this just to bring those values up just a little bit. And you can see now all the work we've done in the highlights. Looks pretty good. Next thing, instead of going back into the camera raw filter because this is 50 megapixels, I don't want to duplicate this image. I'm going to go into the shadows and I'm going to create contrast in the sky. And I'm going to do that with a curves. And the way that I'm going to do that is just with an S-curve. So this is basically a simulation of what contrast does in brightness and contrast. So as you do this, this is pretty much the simple S-curve mimics the contrast in brightness and contrast. And since that's just in the shadows, we look at the shadows, it should be omitting some of these highlights, at least a little bit of it. I'm going to take it a little bit further. I don't want it to affect the tops of the buildings here. So what I'm going to do is use the gradient tool, and it's going to start from here and end about here. And you can see that we have this as a result. So that looks pretty good, actually. And with that, I can go ahead and tweak it just a little bit more. And you can see it's just like going in there, adding deep contrast or dehaze. It gives us a little bit more intensity on the sky. Now, it's an adjustment layer, too, so you don't have to unlink this. But you can adjust this a little bit. If you want it to happen a little bit higher up in the sky, a little bit lower, you can change it and tweak it a little bit. I just don't want it to touch the tops of the buildings. 
Last thing I want to add in the mid-tones is another curves, but this time I'm going to reverse that curve. So before to add contrast, it's down on the quarter tones and shadows, up on the highlights. I'm going to reverse that, and I'm going to bring up the shadows, and I'm going to pull the highlights down a little bit. So it's another type of S-curve. I actually call it a reverse S-curve, and it gives it a nice look. I don't really want to bring the highlights up too much. I kind of want to lock them off. It gives them a nice boost, but not too much, but it really boosts the shadows. And then I can just go ahead and bring this up just a little bit, alter that just a little bit, and it looks pretty good. At this stage, what I want to do is go back into Lightroom, and I want to reset this. You can see this is where it turned into, but it started out very underexposed. Let's go ahead and get this in there so we can compare it. Use unique names. Select all. Copy. And we'll just go ahead and paste it on the top. The bottom here, call it Original Raw. All right, let's walk through everything that we created together. So this one was fairly complicated in the blending, but basically what we were able to do is we started with the original RAW, just like this. Uh, we adjusted it. We brought in the highlights from the pylons, and then we brought in the blue hour for the city itself. After that, we brought it all together with some deep contrast with the camera RAW filter, and we applied some selective adjustments using luminosity masking. We'll go ahead and bring those in just like that. And you can see, we started with the original RAW. We went from here to here. Now that is an incredible transformation. And that wraps things up here in the post-processing studio. It's time to get back in the field.